Um, first of all, I want to say how honored I am to be a, a, a part of this lecture series. When I look down the list of lecturers, um, many of these are people, including my former teacher, uh, David Hackett Fisher and others, uh, I'm a little uh, stunned uh, to be here. Uh, I, I hope I can live up to the uh, high standards that you have set. And I have to say as well, I had a wonderful day here today visiting a class, uh, meeting some of the people in the, on the faculty here. And um, I can't help but think that um, writing books and giving lectures is a wonderful thing. Uh, but teaching students and working with high school teachers and really working with history on the ground is really what makes history. Uh, in our society, and I'm grateful for all the things that are happening here at this, at this campus, and uh, very happy to, to be here with you. Um, I want to talk to you tonight about uh, American Indian history, um, and I want to um, begin by talking a little bit about, uh, I seem to have knocked something over here, let me just, there we go. Um, I want to I begin by um, giving you the answers to a quiz uh, that I often ask students. I put the answers up on the board here. And the, the question is, uh, name three Indians. And these four images represent uh, the most commonly uh, named Indians by a group of students who are entering class for the first time. I say to them, the point of this quiz is not to uh, prove that I know more than you do, but rather to sort of inventory what's in your minds about American Indians. What do you think of when you think about American Indians and about American Indian history? And so we have uh, Geronimo on the upper right and, and uh, Sitting Bull in the lower left. Uh, and we have an imaginative rendering of Pocahontas uh, from the Jamestown Memorial uh, in the front. And in the back, we have the emerging face of uh, Crazy Horse uh, in the Black Hills, being carved into the Black Hills. No picture was ever taken of Crazy Horse, so this is all imaginative. But these are the answers that people give. And the reason I ask the question and sort of start the conversation this way at the beginning of a class is to point out that what pe most people carry in their minds about American Indian history is that it is something that is dramatic and short and over. Uh, that the symbols of American Indian history for most people in the popular culture are people who are warriors, or people who are somehow involved in American expansion, Pocahontas as a kind of guide and helper. Uh, we talked this afternoon in the class about Sacagawea as another example. But people who are involved with the process of settlement, whether as resistors or as enablers in some way. And I have no interest in denigrating uh, the achievements of any of these individuals, but what I think is so interesting is that Americans, when they think about American Indian history, tend to think of these kinds of people and about this trajectory, about a history of resistance, a history of involvement with settlement, but then a history that's over. There's no living person here. There's no 20th century uh, person here. Now, we can say that's kind of an interesting curiosity. But if we ask another question about these people, with these people in mind, which is, how can these people help us explain this, I think we can see why it's not a very helpful list of people. These images on the upper left is the National Museum of the American Indian on the Mall in Washington, DC. I'm sorry it didn't reproduce very well. And the lower right is the Tribal Council House uh, at Window Rock, uh, Arizona for the Navajo Nation's headquarters. And I have these images up here just to symbolize and represent to suggest the reality of 21st century American Indian life, that American Indian culture and values, traditions, are very much a part of our life today, just as the uh, Museum of the American Indian is sitting right at the foot of Capitol Hill in the, the, the center of, of Washington, D.C., in our nation's uh, capital. And the Navajo Nation headquarters, representing tribal headquarters all over the country of dozens and dozens of tribal governments that operate their own schools, have their own police departments, their own courts, uh, governance systems, health departments, all the rest of it, as governmental parts of our society who are around us today. So in addition to sort of saying, well, it's kind of stereotypical to think about um, Crazy Horse and Geronimo as representing American history, it's also not terribly helpful. Because if you ask the question, how did, how did we get from Geronimo and Crazy Horse to the National Museum of the American Indian, that's a tough question to answer. How do, how do we do that? What, 
What's the connection between those two things? Well, my answer to that is there's another set of people, and there are many stories in American Indian history. I just want to tell you or talk about one tonight. But there's another group of people who I think help us make that connection, help us see how we get from the moment of conquest and dispossession to where we are today. And I think I first started thinking about this when I was doing research many years ago uh, on, a, on the Crow Indians in, in Montana. <clears throat> and I was uh, going through the dusty records of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, looking at correspondence between Crow Agency Montana and Washington, D.C. And I came across a letter from a law firm in Washington that said, uh, we would like to meet with you on behalf of the Crow Indians to discuss grazing leases on their reservation. We don't think they're getting enough money for uh, leasing their land. And we'd like to meet with the Commissioner of Indian Affairs to renegotiate these leases. And the letter back from the Bureau of Indian Affairs was, um, <clears throat> you're not permitted to represent this tribe. You're not authorized to be the law firm representing this tribal government, this tribal government only the Bureau of Indian Affairs can uh, work for American, can represent American Indians. Um, and then there was another letter that came right after that. The uh, <clears throat> Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs wrote to the tribal council in uh, Montana and said, we understand that you've hired a law firm uh, in Washington, D.C. You're not allowed to hire a law firm uh, you are Indians, you are wards of the United States government, you cannot have a lawyer. And the letter back from the Commissioner of from the Indians in Montana, which said, please direct your inquiries to our attorney in Washington. <laughs> when I read that exchange of correspondence, I began to think there's a lot more going on in these communities than warfare and exploration. That there were other people in these communities <clears throat> who were um, advocates for their community, excuse me, who were not warriors, at least they were not military warriors, uh, who were people who were advocates uh, for their community. And over the years, as I got involved in other projects, these people kept emerging through time in different communities that I worked with or that I studied in different parts of the, parts of the country. And so I decided that I would try to write a book about them. And I called them political activists, people who were active politically, who were engaged in the political system, but who were not, and who were, who were unlicensed for the most part. Some of them were attorneys, some of them were just simply lobbyists, some of them were writers, some of them were troublemakers of all kinds, lecturers and so on. But they wanted a political solution to the problems, the divisions uh, <clears throat> separating Indian people and the United States. And I think it's those activists that are the connection between conquest and these images we, we have here. And that's why the subtitle of my book and my lecture is The Place They Made, because the activists made a place for American Indians in American society. Let me tell you a little bit about how that happened. As I began thinking about the different activists that were, that were um, uh, engaged with Indian affairs over the last 200 years, uh, and I began looking at the details of what they said and what they argued about and trying to summarize a very complex and diverse story, uh, I realized that there were three themes that these activists came back to again and again. The first was that Indians had rights. They had rights to certain things, whether they were based on a treaty or a, con or a congressional resolution or maybe simply a promise that someone made but that they were, they were obligations that had been incurred and that they demanded that that promise, that that right be recognized. The second thing that Indians demanded or discussed, these activists discussed, was the idea of autonomy. That tribal governments, tribal people, tribal communities should be allowed to live without interference. Now, for most Americans, that seems like an obvious demand. But for Indian people, who were often under the wing of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and being controlled by various agencies and so on, the idea of being left alone to run their lives the way they wished was something that challenged a lot of governmental regulations and traditions. So autonomy was something that came up over and over again. And finally, a theme that, that again, doesn't sound like a very radical demand uh, was the idea of humanity, 
that we will be treated, we should be treated as human beings. We are fellow human beings and therefore we should be treated, we should interact with each other on the basis of respect and equality. Again, it seemed like a fairly easy demand. But over time, in different settings, these were often very challenging ideas for Native people to express before the United States. As I look further into this, thinking about these three uh, themes, I uh, decided uh, that these themes were expressed and evolved over three time periods. First, in the first phase, which covers most of the 19th century, uh, Indian people were, there were, the Indian activists were, were pioneers. Uh, this is an image of, of the, from the end of the 18th century uh, of Indian people meeting with representatives, in this case of the British government, in a treaty council. Treaty councils, formal meetings, these were, these were traditional when the American government was formed at the end of the American Revolution. And in these uh, treaty negotiations, in these meetings, in these councils, uh, promises would be made. And these Indian pioneers would, be, would, ex, would, would demand that those promises be enforced. During those councils, they also were promises about autonomy, and also these councils were obviously human interactions. So in this pioneering phase, uh, Indians would stand up and sort of name those themes as being important. Now, they were often the losing side of the debates, but they named them nevertheless, and they became the sort of basis for political discussion among Indian people and between Indian people and the United States. In the second phase, um, these pioneers begin to talk to one another and create networks. And by the end of the 19th century, in the very beginning of the 20th century, we see networks of Indian activists beginning to talk with one another and beginning to interact with one another. This is a picture of Indian delegates meeting with the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, who's the guy with the mustache in the front row. He's a Texas cattleman named Cato Sells. Um, and if you look at the at the captions underneath, you see you have uh, Marie Baldwin, a Ojibwe from Minnesota, uh, Charles Daganet, uh, Peoria from uh, Indian Territory, later Oklahoma, or Oklahoma at that time, uh, Francis LaFleche, who was from Nebraska, Sherman Coolidge, who was from Wyoming, Thomas Sloan, who was also from Nebraska, and Robert Owen from, from Oklahoma. So we have these people from different parts of the country, different tribes, different generations, one a minister, another a lawyer, another an anthropologist, who are beginning to network together to sort of create a common front against the uh, uh, imposition of authority from, from the United States. So we have pioneers, we have networkers, and then by the middle of the 20th century, after this period of networking and so on, we begin to have professionals. Uh, this is the delegate, uh, the representative of the National Congress of American Indians, uh, Frank George, meeting with John F. Kennedy, uh, uh, as the campaign for president is beginning in 1960, and really represents the movement of these activists from simply talking with one another and coordinating into the formation of actual organizations and formal uh, pressure uh, and, and formal uh, demands against the, um, against the United States. Well, let me talk a little more detail about these phases of pioneers, networkers, and professionals among the activists. The activist career, the activist generation, really begins with the part of one of the darkest chapters in American Indian history, the era of removal uh, in the Southeast. This is a map many of you have seen before, I'm sure, showing where tribes in the Southeast, the Cherokees, Choctaws, Creeks, and others, uh, were in the Southeast and their, their forced uh, uh, removal uh, into the, um, what, what was then Indian Territory, right down the road here that became Oklahoma. What was, and aside from the, the personal tragedies and the dislocations that took place here, the removal crisis uh, generated uh, a kind of crisis of relationships between tribal people and the United States. And the reason for that crisis was that the southern states, led by Georgia most explicitly, said we will no longer recognize treaties made between the United States and Indian tribes. We want them out. We will not recognize that federal authority we will sell their land out from under them, which they began to do. Uh, we, we want this land for cotton. We want this land for other, for other things. The Indian uh, leadership uh, was stunned by this because they were all living on territory, these yellow territories in the, on the right, uh, that had been guaranteed to them through treaties by, by formal promises ratified by the, 
by the United States Senate. And in the midst of this crisis, that is, we have treaties and promises and laws on the one hand, and we have tremendous political pressure on the other hand, there arose a group of Indian leaders who began to make arguments against the United States, not that stay out of our land or we'll go to war with you, but began to make legal arguments against the United States. We have John Ross on the upper right, who was the, the uh, uh, chief of the Cherokees, who took the United States to, to court. Uh, we have Peter Pitchlin on the upper left, who was a, a Choctaw leader, uh, who led his people eventually to, uh, to Oklahoma, to Indian Territory. Uh, we have Pushmataha on the lower left, who is wearing a military uniform here, which he was given by the United States because he fought with Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, Andrew Jackson met with him in 1820 uh, in Mississippi and said, get out. Your time is up. We don't want to recognize treaties anymore. All these people were shocked by this. These were people who had been a part of the system. There's no image on the lower right because the person I want to talk about for just a couple of minutes here is James McDonald, who was the first Indian lawyer and really is a kind of uh, heroic activist of this period. Unfortunately, there is no image of him. He died without anyone ever, ever photographing or drawing him or painting him. Uh, but James McDonald was, a, was a, the son of a white trader and a Choctaw woman who had been sent to missionary boarding school uh, in the first, decades of the, the first decade of the 19th century. He was born in 1801, and in 1813 he was sent to Baltimore to a friend's, a, a, a Quaker school. Following that, he went to Washington, D.C. and worked in the Indian office as a clerk. He was so good at his job, so brilliant, uh, that the people who were sort of his, um, his employers in the Indian office thought they would sort of make an example of him as a civilized Indian and uh, sent him, to, first of all, to a, 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 a sort of boarding school or a prep school in, um, in Georgetown in Washington, uh, and then to read law with a, with a very prominent lawyer in Ohio. James McDonald comes back to Mississippi, his home country, uh, to his Choctaw people uh, in 1824, just as this removal crisis is, is reaching its uh, peak. There are lots of ins and outs to the story, but what happens to James McDonald is he accompanies a group of chiefs, including Pushmataha here on the left, to Washington, D.C. So he's not only the first Indian trained as a lawyer to be operating in, in, uh, in the United States, but he's the first Indian lawyer to accompany a delegation to Congress. And during the ensuing negotiations at the end of 1824, he becomes the leader of the negotiation. He's the first time that you have a lawyer drafting proposals, exchanging uh, uh, information back and forth between the government and the tribe and trying to find a, a, a solution to the disputes between them. They finally sign a treaty in early 1825 and they return to Mississippi. But What's remarkable, and I know it's a little unfair to put text up here, so I, I, I will just focus on a couple of key uh, phrases here, is when they're leaving Washington in, in, in the winter of 1825, James McDonald writes a memo to Congress, which is published in the congressional record, uh, which says essentially, you are a society of laws, therefore we expect you to enforce our rights. As he says here, you have institutions to promote and disseminate the knowledge of every branch of science. You have a government. You have laws, all founded upon those principles of liberty and equality. The theory of your government is justice and good faith to all men. You will not submit to injury from one party because it is powerful, nor will you oppress another because it is weak. He's invoking all the principles of the United States. And then the kicker at the end, he says, impressed with that persuasion, we are confident that our rights will be preserved. Okay? So here is an activist who is playing with a very weak hand and the political winds are blowing hard against him. And he's saying to this rising power of the United States, we trust that you will protect our rights. Now, Andrew Jackson and his buddies and the other millions of people who were in favor of Indian removal didn't really think about Indians as having rights. But McDonald insisted that it was American values that guaranteed Indian rights. And really, it's this document that I say is the beginning of what we now call federal Indian law, of, of the law of treaties and rules and so on, where Indian tribes go to court to enforce their rights according to agreements. And it's a remarkable moment, I think, in the history of activism. So here is a pioneer uh, speaking out, a lonely voice, but a voice that will be picked up by others and that will continue uh, later on. 
Well, the next chapter in this movement of pioneers uh, takes place in Indian territory when tribes come to uh, this part of the world uh, and begin to resettle themselves uh, as tribal governments and as societies. So we have, many of you I'm sure have been to Tahlequah, you know, the Cherokee capital that's here, but there's a Creek capital and a Choctaw capital and so on. And these societies begin to organize together. And they develop new leaders and new, new people who are defending them uh, and speaking for them uh, at this time. Um, they uh, begin to, they, well, they come here with, again, with promises uh, on treaties that they will have uh, secure homelands, that they will never be made a part of a state, that they will never have to worry about being removed uh, again. But the pressures begin almost immediately and a new generation of leaders who are uh, familiar with these documents and familiar with their status as, a, as tribal people uh, begin to defend the idea that we as tribal communities should be allowed to live as we want. We are part of the United States, we're loyal to the United States, but we should be allowed to be autonomous. And the principal architect of this argument is a fascinating character named William Potter Ross. John Ross, the famous chief of the Cherokees, uh, had a sister uh, whose son was William Potter Ross. And in the Cherokee world, that is in many uh, Native communities, uncles and um, uh, nephews were, had a very close relationship. So anyway, uh, uh, William Potter Ross was, was a close advisor to um, uh, John Ross. And one of the things he, he did when he first came to Indian Territory, and by the way, William Potter Ross was not uh, some farm boy from Georgia. Uh, he was part of an elite family and was sent to Princeton. He was a member of the class of 1842, uh, and he came to Indian Territory from Princeton. And the first job he was given was to uh, write up a description of what was called the International Council that was held uh, in Indian Territory, where the different tribes that had been assigned there, that had come there, and the tribes that were already learning, living there, uh, met together to try to work out some agreement on how they would live with each other, how they would live together uh, in, this new, in this new land. And right from the beginning, William Potter Ross, who, who edited the Cherokee newspaper at first and then became a Cherokee councilman and a Cherokee official, uh, began writing about the importance of uh, making agreements and peace among all the tribes in Indian Territory and of having a united front against the United States. But he also, uh, and he, he stuck to that cause for the rest of his career. When his uncle died, he became chief of the Cherokees and he served in a variety of, of offices uh, until his death in 1890. After the Civil War, the pressures uh, expanded on uh, of settlers, people from around here, people from Kansas who wanted to come in and have some of that land. Uh, William Potter Ross was a regular delegate to Congress who would argue and, and make speeches uh, in Congress about the Cherokees and the, and the tribes of Indian Territory right to be left alone. And even though I knew that before I really got very far into uh, William Potter Ross, I have to say that when I read this speech in the left-hand column um, of the uh, uh, slide here, uh, I just about fell off my chair. I was reading uh, a, a, a file of speeches, and he says at one point, um, we want to be like San Marino. He says this in 1873. I had to stop and say, what's a San Marino? Where is San Marino? And I quickly learned uh, that San Marino is a principality in Italy. And he made this speech just as Garibaldi was uniting the Italians around a new Italian government, but was also allowing old city-states and principalities like San Marino to maintain their independence. And William Potter Ross is looking at that happening across the sea of Europe and says, um, we should be like San Marino. So he says, their independence was motivated by as pure a glow of patriotism and delight as ever animated the brow of ancient or modern civilization. No Indian nation on this continent has shown a more conspicuous bearing in history than of America than the Cherokees, that we are as progressive as the people in San Marino and we deserve to be treated in the same kind of way. Uh, soon after that, uh, William Potter Ross also organized a constitutional convention of all of the tribes in Indian Territory and they wrote a constitution uh, in Okmulgee uh, in, in uh, Indian Territory and they devised a constitutional government that would, that would allow them all to live as a, as a principality uh, within the United States. Um, and uh, the point that they wanted to make in that is that they were not backward savages 
and they were also not opposed to progress. He says, we have been charged with opposition to progress. We are not opposed to progress. We're not opposed to improvements. We're not opposed to civilization. We're not opposed to the Christian religion. Uh, we want protection and security. So as another part of this um, pioneering uh, generation of activists, uh, William Potter Ross uh, makes this case and makes this argument. He, uh, as I say, he died in 1890. He didn't lo live long enough to see the destruction of the Cherokee government that was to take place at the end of the century. Um, but again, like MacDonald, he's speaking out against the forces of history that are arrayed against him but he's laying the groundwork, making arguments that other people would pick up. One of the most poignant uh, documents of William Potter Ross's career was testifying before Congress uh, in the 1880s, and I read a newspaper account that said, uh, describing him before a hearing of people, there was proposals to open Indian territory to settlers and so on, uh, and he was speaking against it, explaining treaty rights, and lecturing the senators and so on, and the reporter said, um, that Mr. Ross's uh, presentation was also witnessed by other leaders from Indian territory, and they listed the leaders of other tribes, uh, and several other Indians who happened to be in the city at the same time. So he was also lecturing other Indians. He was lecturing other people about the importance of autonomy as a principle uh, for future relations between the United States uh, and Indian people. Here's a not very, there are nobody really great happy pictures of William Potter Ross, that's the best I could do. And this is a picture of the Okmulgee uh, uh, Constitutional Conference. They had several of these meetings uh, and continued to advocate for uh, independent uh, kind of territorial government for Indian Territory. Well, I don't know whether she was in the room or not, um, but Sarah Winnemucca was in Washington at the same time as, as um, William Potter Ross. And she's our third pioneer that I wanted to talk about for a few minutes uh, because she represents that third uh, element of the activist agenda, and that is the demand for humanity. Sarah Winnemucca was born in, right on the border between uh, Nevada and California. She's a Paiute. Uh, she was born in 1844. So as a child, she witnessed the California gold rush. She witnessed the rush of people to California. And she witnessed it also because her community was not far from where Reno, Nevada is today, and it was right on the highway of people rushing to get to California. So she saw the, the number of people that came, she saw the destruction of the environment caused by herds of cattle and horses and wagons and all of those things that, that came uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the area. Uh, she also, as a young girl, uh, her father was a, was a prominent uh, Paiute leader uh, who actually allied himself with the United States, served as a aid to Fremont when he came to explore California. He fought alongside the Americans during the Mexican War. Uh, and he, she went to California with her uh, father in the, in the early 1850s as a young girl. But while she was there, as she recalled in her autobiography later on, she witnessed not only the arrival of Americans, but of violence and chaos. This, after all, was the period of the, of the rush for gold, a very unregulated society. Uh, and so she saw American expansion not as something peaceful and benign and progressive, but as something that was dangerous and violent. Um, she went on in her career, she became very proficient in English, uh, and in the 1870s, she became a translator, an interpreter, uh, at a number of Indian agencies in Nevada. And she really kind of kept that role of interpreter and translator uh, for the rest of her life. In the course of being an interpreter, she became aware that agents in different uh, reservations were cheating uh, their people. They were allowing people to run cattle on Indian land and not paying the Indians. He, they were taking supplies destined for Indians and selling them on the open market. The kind of corruption that was endemic, unfortunately, in the Indian office uh, at that time. And she began to speak out against it. Well, as you might imagine, she got fired for that. Uh, but she began uh, traveling uh, first in the West, and then across the country, uh, lecturing about Indian rights. She found sympathetic audiences, particularly among women, and among women reformers, suffragists, women's rights activists. And in the early 1880s, she made friends with a group of activists in Boston uh, who sponsored her to come and, and stay in Boston and to write up her lectures. And she did that in 1883 and published the first autobiography, the first book written by an American Indian woman, called Life Among the Paiutes. 
And Life Among the Paiutes opens with this description of American expansion into the West. Now you think about that statement and picture in your mind the romantic paintings of Western landscapes, the heroic images of heroes conquering the plains and so on, and then, thinking of, then reflect on this voice. I was a very small child when the first white man came into our country. They came like a lion and have continued so ever since. What she was saying was, this is a human view of what this process is. This is not romance. This is not progress. This is not the advancement of civilization. These are the actions of a violent, expansive people. And she insisted that Manifest Destiny and these uh, um, wonderful sounding phrases had a human cost. Uh, this is the photograph of her uh, uh, lecturing um, in Boston. Uh, she would often appear, uh, she would appear both in uh, quote unquote civilized dress, these wonderful Victorian costumes, and then she would appear in, a, in buckskin uh, as well. But the high point of her lecture was usually when she would talk about things that she had witnessed in her life, injustices and violence and so on. Uh, and then she would turn to her audience and kind of step out of the frame rather than talking about Paiute life. She would turn to her audience and say, you who are educated by a Christian government, you who call yourselves the great civilizers, your so-called civilization sweeps inland from the ocean wave. I am crying out to you for justice. So what she really is saying is, here's something going on. Look at me as a person and give us justice. She's demanding a human interaction and a human relationship. So with Sarah Winnemucca, we come to the end of the 19th century, and we have these elements injected into Indian activist language, rights, autonomy, humanity. And I focused on three people, but these ideas, as I said, in the course of my research, I found many of these letters and arguments and documents, and these themes keep coming up, whether it's in the Southeast or in the Great Lakes or in the Midwest or in the Southwest. There are people who are insisting on these things. We have certain rights. We should be autonomous. We should be treated as humans. What happens by the end of the 19th century is that these people begin to meet in Washington, D.C. Their paths begin to cross uh, with one another. And the best illustration I have of that uh, is, is from this, uh, that I'll, I'll, is, is prompted by this uh, slide of a delegation of Ojibwe Indians, uh, only uh, none of whom could speak English, the people in the front row who are the tribal leaders, uh, coming to Washington, D.C. to file a lawsuit in the United States Court of Claims. The United States Court of Claims is a, is a court, special court established for American citizens to file grievances if they've been, if your uh, house has been destroyed by a federal action of some kind and so on. There are various categories where you have standing to sue the United States. Um, and this was a court that Indian people in Indian territory began to use after removal. They got some special provisions in Congress to go before the court and say, I had a farm in Georgia that was worth so much money, it was destroyed, I want to be compensated for it. And these lawsuits began uh, before the Civil War, they emerged after the Civil War. And the first case that was settled was a Choctaw case in 1886, where the Supreme Court, the, excuse me, the uh, Court of Claims said to the Choctaws, you have a case and we recommend you, you be compensated for it. And they recommended that Congress pass a uh, resolution, uh, appropriation to pay them uh, their just um, compensation for their losses. Uh, interestingly, uh, the Choctaws were the first to uh, win a case like this. Uh, they were represented by Peter Pitchlin, whose picture I showed you earlier, who was a childhood friend of James McDonald. So there's one little place where that, that activist uh, insistence uh, reemerges. But what's interesting about the Court of Claims is not just that the Choctaws uh, won it but, it, but that there were more than 30 cases brought before the US Court of Claims over the next 30 years. But interestingly, when I went back and tabulated these cases, the first 10 cases are all from Indian territory. They're all about removal. Of the second 10 cases, two of them are from some other part of the country, not from Indian territory. 
of the third set of cases, which are filed in the first decade of the 20th century, none of them are from Indian Territory. So what that tells me is that other tribes were beginning to hear about this process. This network was beginning to function, and people were beginning to identify lawyers, identify procedures, figure out how these cases would be brought, and they begin to be filed. And so an example of this are the Mille Lacs Ojibwe's, far from Indian Territory, far from any formal connection. Uh, they were told by the United States government at the end of the 1880s, uh, your treaty is no longer valued, val valid, you have to move. And they were forced, many of them were forced to leave their homes in this, around this lake uh, in central Minnesota, a very small reservation. These group of people resisted. They said, our treaty doesn't say that. We, we negotiated the treaty, we know what it says. We have, a, a, gr we have a, a grievance against the United States. And with their lawyer, the man on the upper right, uh, a man named Gus Bolio, who was himself part Indian, they lobbied before Congress. They got permission to take their case to the Court of Claims. And in 1911, they won. They won a cash settlement from the United States for compensation for their land. Now, um, dealing with federal power is very difficult. Uh, and one of the things the tribes learned was they got money, they didn't get land. But they used the money, or some of the money, to buy land. The Mille Lacs people are still there, still in their community. And it's this action that allowed them to survive into the future. So here are people who are networking with one another to make that case for their rights as a people and to be treated as human, human beings. Another example of these kind of networks that um, uh, evolve in the early 20th century is this newsletter <clears throat> published by uh, Carlos Montezuma, a remarkable man, I'm proud to say a graduate of the University of Illinois, chemistry major, uh, who became a physician in Chicago um, and who founded a uh, a newspaper called Wasaha uh, that was dedicated to um, defending the rights of tribal people and tribal governments to live free from the control of the Indian office. So you see the Indian Bureau uh, oppressing, uh, squeezing down, smashing down uh, the Indian in this, uh, in this image. Um, uh, Montezuma opposed the draft during World War I, which did not make him very popular in Washington. Uh, but he also was an advocate for tribal government and for tribal uh, rights uh, during this period. And his newspaper and the organizations that he was a part of sort of spread the word um, uh, in, this, uh, in this way. Another example of networking is the picture I showed you earlier. Uh, here now are people who are all involved in a new organization called the Society of American Indians. It was founded in 1911, and it was founded around these activist principles, defending treaty rights, tribal rights, to um, uh, defending the, the rights of tribes to live autonomously, uh, and also demanding humane treatment. So here they are meeting with the, Bureau of in, with the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, uh, demanding a face-to-face -face meeting and a personal discussion of the issues in front of them. This process of networking continues in the first decades of the 20th century. And my argument is that these ideas that have been proposed tried out by the pioneers in the 19th century, get picked up by these people and amplified and spread around the country. And so you have more and more tribal delegations coming to Washington, meeting with each other, forming organizations, forming newsletters, spreading this, these ideas uh, around the Indian community. We reach a new stage after World War II. After World War II, we have a whole generation of mostly men who come back from the service uh, who are very concerned about the future of their communities, who are activists, and who form a new organization, and who really move from being networkers to being professionals. This is a group of them uh, who are at the founding meeting of the National Congress of American Indians, an Indian advocacy group that represents tribes that was organized at the end of World War II and at the end of 1944. If you could read the um, caption at the bottom, uh, it says these are ex-Carlylers, that is, ex-graduates of the Carlisle Indian School. And there's a sort of sweet, from my point of view anyway, irony to this. They had attended this school in, in uh, Pennsylvania, very famous as a school where Jim Thorpe was a student, uh, where students were dressed in military uniforms, marched to chapel, marched to class, uh, inculcated with quote-unquote American values, forced to be they're not allowed to speak their tribal language, all of those sorts of things, forced to be Americans. At the end of this product, 
Here you have people who have been through that process who are saying, we are going to be advocates for our community. We are going to be advocates for, we're going to be political activists supporting the idea of treaty rights, autonomy, and um, of, of, of human uh, relationship with each other. Uh, this organization grows during the 1940s and 50s, um, and uh, these are some of their leaders um, in, the, uh, in the middle of the 1950s. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner is a man named Darcy McNichol, who was from Montana, from the Flathead Reservation in, in northwestern uh, Montana. I'll just say a couple of things about him, particularly in this idea of autonomy, because Darcy McNichol begins to argue as part of the National Congress of American Indians at this time, um, that American Indians really are not so different. This is in the early 1950s, the beginning of the Cold War. He says, American Indians really aren't so different from the countries around the world that we're trying to aid and support uh, to, to uh, keep them away from the communist camp. That American Indian communities deserve foreign aid pretty much the way countries do overseas. And so he began to talk about making grants to Indian communities to help for economic development. And what he was arguing for here was not just a kind of clever projection of foreign aid onto Indians, but he was also saying this should not be in the, in the uh, framework of uh, paternalism. That is, it not should be the Indian office should not be teaching Indians how to plow or in the, how to become Christians, but rather we should be making grants to tribal governments just as we make grants to foreign governments. This is a little bit of the San Marino argument uh, coming back again, echoing back again. Um, uh, in, the, in the 20th century. Uh, that idea is one of the kernels that reemerges a decade later uh, in the war on poverty programs in the 1960s. Now those are controversial programs. Some people think they worked, they didn't work. What was really important about American Indians in the war on poverty was that McNichol's idea was implemented in that law. That is, Tribal governments would apply to the Office of Economic Opportunity for a grant for, say, a hospital program or a school or some other improvement, and they would be granted a federal subsidy that they would administer themselves. For almost 200 years, anything like that had gone to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and had been administered as a program to, quote unquote, improve the tribe by someone else. Now they had the autonomy to create their own programs. It really is this moment that we see the shift to modern tribal governments and modern uh, ways of thinking about tribal governments as legitimate governments, more or less equivalent to counties uh, or other small uh, governmental units uh, in the United States. And it really begins with the, or it emerges in the public arena uh, with McNichol and with other professional activists uh, like him. Well, these activists probably are people that some of you may recognize. Um, because we move, uh, we get into the 1960s and 70s uh, into people who are comfortable with um, television, comfortable with uh, public uh, communication, uh, who are skilled lobbyists and skilled uh, political leaders. And they take that message from the pioneers that's been spread and developed by the networkers and they begin to uh, make it a national uh, campaign. So we have in the upper left Vine Deloria who was a, a, a Sioux author uh, and lawyer who wrote a book in 1969 called Custer Died for Your Sins. He had a great sense of humor. Uh, he always said that the Washington Monument should be renamed the Indian Monument because they all got the shaft. Uh, and he had a one-liner for almost every uh, occasion in that way. He was a very funny man. But he had always, there was a real point to what he wanted to, what he uh, said. He also became a professor at the University of Arizona and began and wrote and, and spoke widely during the 1970s and 80s about autonomy, about treaty rights, and really about the idea that this country would be better served by dropping a paternalistic attitude towards Indian people and recognizing Indian communities and Indian traditions as the equivalent, as human uh, traditions uh, in the world. Uh, on the right are the tribal elders from uh, Taos Pueblo uh, north of Santa Fe, uh, who are meeting with Robert Kennedy in this picture to become advocates for the return of Blue Lake, a sacred lake to the uh, Taos Pueblo that had been incorporated into a national forest by a presidential directive uh, early in the 20th century. Uh, when they began to lobby for the return of Blue Lake, people said this is a lost cause. It's part of the national forest. You'll never, you'll never get it back. 
but coming after these generations of activism and coming in the midst of these other professional activists, they were able to make their case to be photographed at Grand Central, or excuse me, Pennsylvania Station arriving to meet with Senator Kennedy in 1968. Uh, they won a national audience and they began to be heard and in 1970 their lake was returned uh, to their community. Wilma Mankiller from just down the road here in, in uh, Oklahoma, uh, the first woman uh, chief of the Cherokees, uh, became a sort of national spokesman for treaty rights, Indian rights, uh, and women's rights uh, at, the end of her, uh, at the end of her career. So the point of this genealogy of activism is to say there is an activist tradition among American Indian uh, people uh, that uh, didn't come out of the 1960s or didn't come out of some television uh, extravaganza or some trick by some uh, um, uh, charismatic uh, leader, but is actually a deeply uh, rooted uh, tradition within American Indian communities. And we've missed that tradition because we've been distracted by looking at Geronimo and looking for Crazy Horse or looking for some other stereotypical kind of hero. That they are important features of American Indian history, but these activists are the people who actually made a place for Indian rights for Indian humanity, for Indian autonomy uh, in the United States. And I want to just have a couple of more slides to show you uh, and uh, make a few uh, closing comments. I don't want to get into too many controversial subjects here, but I just want to uh, deconstruct a document for you, this image of Ray Halbritter, uh, the chairman of the Oneida tribe, speaking out against the Washington uh, professional football team's name uh, at, a at a conference uh, a few months ago in Washington, D.C. What you're seeing in this slide is an American Indian political leader, uh, not only the leader of a community, but also a leader nationally of a network of other, of other uh, um, political figures, uh, who uh, attended Harvard Law School, uh, who is a sophisticated uh, business leader, his tribe as one of the one of the most uh, profitable casinos in upstate New York, uh, and he's using the resources of his community to, be, to announce uh, a position on a public issue. This is the uh, one example, I'm not saying this is the epitome, but it's one example of this activist tradition. These are people who have, a, have an agenda, who have an idea of what they want to say, and who, because of his position, has the, have the resources uh, to make their case. So here's an example of this long tradition of activism coming into our lives now. Let me just say a few things um, in conclusion. Um, I think the story of political activism is a story of progress. Now, historians like me tend to denigrate the idea of America as the country of progress because usually the country of progress idea has been uh, cloaked in that westward expansion, Frederick Jackson Turner idea that somehow conquering North America was a good thing and made everything better and maybe the Indians had a hard time, but it'll all work out in the end and it's better in the end. That's not the kind of progress that I, that I mean. This is a sort of progress that, uh, despite the violence and dispossession that accompanied national expansion, Native people demonstrated a remarkable ability to adapt and to change uh, in, to adapt to, to new circumstances. They were the agents of a greater democracy in the United States. They were the agents of a better recognition of human rights in the United States. They were the agents of human values in the United States. I'm not saying they were the only ones, but they were powerful agents for these ideas. Their story can be viewed as an affirmation of the US nation state as a tattered but multicultural place after all. Their survival constituted a kind of victory that demonstrates a triumph of individual courage and creativity. So this idea of tribal rights had never been thought of by the people in Washington, D.C. Thomas Jefferson didn't think about tribal rights. Tribal rights was something that Indian people came up with and injected into the larger conversation. The idea of autonomy for culturally different groups is something that Indian people have have uh, interjected. And the idea of human relationships being the fundamental uh, foundation for our society is something that they 
insisted on, even when times were darkest, even when the future looked so bleak to them. Now, any story of progress is dangerous because you sort of end up by saying, well, everything's fine now. No, it's not. It's not perfect, but it's a remarkable story of, of, of a positive change uh, in our society. I like to think of it as kind of an example of a kind of human Big Bang theory uh, of American uh, history. Um, I won't try to uh, equal some of my uh, peers on this list of lecturers by giving you a whole view of American history, but I do think there is something to this idea that freedom and diversity together created a kind of Big Bang of human energy. Sometimes that Big Bang was quite destructive and quite ugly, but at other times that Big Bang of human creativity, of human courage for people like James McDonald and people like William Potter Ross and Sarah uh, Winnemucca, uh, created a better society, created a vision of how things could be uh, that, that no one had ever thought of before. It was a really creative moment and a creative tradition. And so I think these activists represent that uh, for us. I want to just close with a short uh, passage from the end of my book to sort of underscore what I mean by that and what I mean by the title uh, of this lecture. The Indian activist struggle to win recognition from federal authorities accelerated in the 20th century. Benefiting in unexpected ways from the American education that had often been forced upon them, community leaders found new tools in the legal and political arenas and new allies among officials of other tribes and sympathetic non-Indians. By the end of World War II, a group of sophisticated leaders had emerged to solidify the support for tribal autonomy and to insist on the human rights of Indian citizens who deserve to be allowed to live in communities of their own choosing. Undergirding these claims was the explicit demand that Indian people be allowed to live as freely as other human beings and other Americans and to organize their own communities without interference from missionaries, reformers, or federal officials. Almost from the start, American Indian activists had wanted American officials and legislators and all their citizens to appreciate that the nation could represent much more than a beautiful territory that had been wrestled from the grasp of its original inhabitants. By recognizing and defending the rights of native people to occupy and maintain their own homelands within the national landscape, American leaders could finally embrace the humanity of native people and the undeniable truth that Indians did not exist out there back then, but instead that they were and had always been fellow travelers on the American journey. Discovering the legacy of American Indian activists then opens a doorway to the discovery of a new place, this American country. Thank you. <laughs>